Thank you. It's uh, amazing to see so many people out here to uh, talk about uh, talk about this uh, tonight. Um, please do stop me if, if if there's something that I say that just doesn't make sense at all. Uh, they'd like us to hold questions so that um, we can be clearer if the, uh, when this is seen on video. But um, but by all means, if I say something that really uh, is not understandable, uh, let me know. No conflict of interest. So many of you may be familiar with this map. Uh, it is a map of Washington, DC. And it shows life expectancy in those uh, big circles. Uh, 77 in the district, 84 out in the suburbs, large differences. Um, this is, uh, uh, if, uh, this is uh, th th these are differences of life expectancy for people who live in these areas. Here is the same thing uh, done uh, by actually the Federal Reserve, an analysis done by the Federal Reserve Bank here. And it shows about a life expectancy of about 73 years in downtown Oakland, and a life expectancy of about 84 years, which is 11 years more, in Walnut Creek. So these are very large differences in life expectancy, enormously large differences. And these symbols say how much uh, income, the median income is in each of these places. The, media, the number of uh, people with uh, college degrees, and hospitalizations for childhood asthma, which is small here and very large here. And if you like, there are many more charts like this for all sorts of different cities on the uh, Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation uh, website. What explains these? Well, the social determinants of health. What are the social determinants of health? What determines uh, how we live, work, play, and study. And, it is, and, we, and, and it is these things that are most, uh, con, uh, most closely associated with life expectancy. People's education, income inequality, both, both absolute income and degree of income inequality, issues of the built environment, Issues of social inclusion and exclusion with socially excluded groups usually uh, having a much worse uh, health. Employment, social networks, minority status, health practices, and much more. It's important to talk about this when I start to give a talk around health care disparities. And the reason I open my talk by, by talking about the social determinants of health is to explain that what I'm going to talk about, which is health care disparities, is actually only a very small contributor to health outcomes. Let me see if I can explain that better. Here is a well-known chart um, on uh, proportional contributions to premature health. And these folks have uh, divvied this up into behavioral patterns, genetic predisposition, Social circumstances, environmental exposure, and healthcare. And healthcare here, here contributes about 10% uh, to uh, proportional contribution to uh, premature death, which is to say it only contributes a little bit. And that these other factors, these social determinants and biological determinants in, in, within particular settings, contribute much more. And that's a very difficult idea for us to really, truly understand, because so much of, uh, of the way our society is organized um, tends to argue against that. So I like this graph. When I, whenever I think of how do I best explain the social determinants of health, this is a, a slide of a mean annual death rate, and this is in uh, thousands, in England and Wales from 1840 to 1967. Now, tuberculosis is an infectious disease, and antibiotics is one of the great accomplishments of modern medicine, that we can actually give antibiotics to treat uh, uh, infectious disease, and including tuberculosis. So I ask you, we did all of this. This is a wonderful achievement. So when did antibiotics for tuberculosis become widely available? Here in 1959. We did this, and that's good, 
Healthcare is a great, great thing. But this large decrease in the prevalence of uh, tuberculosis and consequently in the death rate is a great example of how differences in housing, in, uh, uh, in the built environment, the context of how close housing is, um, uh, host factors, nutritional factors, people's ability to fight off tuberculosis, um, and, uh, in, and even uh, hygienic measures. All of this was contributed to by better nutrition, better housing, better air, better respiratory conditions. Healthcare did this. And it's by looking at something like that that I really understand what are the social determinants of health and what does healthcare contribute. And as a doctor, I focus on healthcare, and the rest of my talk will focus on healthcare. But I, whenever we talk about vulnerability and inequity in health, it's so important to uh, uh, remember the social determinants. And I put this slide in uh, because I love this slide and also because it, it highlights a point um, uh, that is necessary, I, uh, I think, for, uh, in order to comprehend this. This is actually a slide of the U.S.-Canadian border taken from a satellite, and it shows, um, I think, the heat images. What I want you to see is this, that from a satellite, you can see the border. Now, that's incredible, right? Because the border is just a line on the graph. So why can you see the border? And this reflects differences in water policies on both sides and differences in the amount of, of uh, grass and uh, uh, greenery on both sides. So what we find is that these folks think their environment is a natural environment. And these folks think their environment is a natural environment. And both are, in fact, natural environments. But they have different policies that have so shaped that natural environment that from a satellite above, you can see the policy lines. Isn't that cool? OK. So with that, let's move to the meat of our talk, which is to differentiate. Uh, and I have uh, three objectives. To differentiate disparities in healthcare from inequities in health. We started to talk about that to recognize some common explanations of disparities, and I'll show you a few models. And then I'll give you uh, the same um, recommendations. I, give, I do this talk for the medical students, and I'll give you the same recommendations I share with them around where can we make uh, inroads to decrease uh, healthcare disparities. So what are health disparities? Health disparities are potentially avoidable differences in health, the prevalence of a disease, the mortality, or the burden of disease between groups of people who are more or less advantaged socially. So the focus here is on potentially avoidable, that it doesn't have to be that way. Right now, more whites, for example, get cystic fibrosis. More African Americans are likely to have sickle cell anemia. Right now, we don't have, a, say, a fetal um, cure. Actually, we may be evolving that. Uh, but we're on the border. We, we still don't have a fetal cure for those diseases. So right now, that's not a disparity. That's just a difference that two different groups get, have different prevalence of disease. On the other hand, potentially um, asthma hospitalizations for asthma and higher rates among low-income people and minority populations reflect not only greater prevalence because of the living conditions, but uh, poorer um, uh, health care. What are health care disparities? If those are differences in health, and health is an outcome, mortality, hospitalization, and so on, what is a health care disparity? It is a difference in the access or the quality of health among specific populations that are not attributable to clinical needs or to the patient's preferences, um, or to the patient's preferences. Usually, access, which is a known problem in US healthcare, is not included so much in looking at healthcare disparities that tend to focus more on the quality. Traditional literature has focused more on the quality. But nonetheless, it's important. So here's your first quiz. I give this to the medical students. They always get it wrong. Here it is, cardiovascular disease death rate. Does this re here we have clear differences. Does this represent a health disparity or a health care disparity? 
Anyone? All right, so what are we looking at? We're looking at death rate. Death rate is an outcome, right? It's a mortality outcome. So that's a difference in health. On the other hand, and here's the trick, there may be a healthcare disparity hidden in here that actually is provoking this to have more, uh, uh, say, for example, higher uh, prevalence of death among uh, African Americans. So the answer is either both or you can't tell. Does that make sense? This is a standard model put out by the Institute of Medicine to define healthcare disparities. Here we have a graph where on the y-axis we have quality of healthcare, and here we have populations with equal access to health to healthcare. Two populations who are both getting in the door. And what we find is that there is a difference in the quality of the healthcare. Now some of that difference may be due to clinical appropriateness. People come in differently, they should get different things. Some of that may be due to patient preferences. Not everyone wants a surgery. Not everyone wants a particular procedure. And that's quite uh, appropriate. But for if you subtract out clinical appropriateness and patient preferences in, from this difference, what's left is the healthcare disparity. And in their um, landmark report, Unequal Treatment, the Institute of Medicine um, defined disparities in this way and said furthermore that it was due to two things, the operation of our healthcare systems and discrimination, bias, and I'll, go, I'll explain that more, bias, stereotyping, and uncertainty. So to repeat, the social determinants of health are what establish patterns of disease and health. Why there was the, so it's the social determinants that say why there was so much tuberculosis in one period and so much less tuberculosis now, and I can tell you that socioeconomic status and other uh, uh, predictors of social determinants of health are by far the most uh, uh, clearest predictors of mortalities among both African Americans and whites in the United States. On the other hand. Health uh, disparities may or may not track with healthcare disparities. And I know that this can be confusing, but let me show you this. Latinos have a lower rate of cardiovascular uh, death rate. You see, it's lower than whites, lower than African Americans. Is that because Latinos have better healthcare? No. I see some, a lot of people shaking heads, like, no. Um, is it because they have better? Uh, social determinants of health, higher incomes, higher education? No. So there's a lot to this that is hard to understand that complicates the pictures. And sometimes healthcare disparities push in the same direction as the social determinants of health, as is often the case with African Americans. And sometimes they don't, in which a population can have not great social determinants of health and not great access to health care and still often have some better mortality outcomes. And just to clarify before we go any further, this Latino advantage is only seen in some diseases. So for example, in diabetes, highly prevalent in the Latino community, strongly associated with low income and uh, low education, and unfortunately very high uh, morbidity and mortality associated with it. So when we talk about racial and ethnic disparities in health, we see far fewer studies than the, uh, only in the last 10 years have there been more studies in these populations. And it's a somewhat more complex narrative where the differences in healthcare are not always associated um, with the expected differences in health outcomes. For Latinos, much of this may be driven by immigration. Foreign-born Latinos um, tend to have better outcomes, and in fact, uh, as do foreign-born Asians, than either native-born Asians or native-born Latinos. And foreign-born Asians and foreign-born Latinos have the highest life expectancy of groups in the United States. So disparities in healthcare exist, and let's talk about, about what they are. Let me turn first to discrimination. We talk about provider-driven healthcare disparities, and what provider-driven healthcare disparities refer to healthcare disparities that we as physicians and or clinicians un, um, can uh, shape and be responsible for. And to a lot of people, it looks like we're calling doctors as racist. That's not what we're doing. Let me see if I can explain this a little bit. 
Here we have data from our own medical students. This is uh, still in publication. Around, we asked them, when you were on the wards, did you directly observe lower quality of health care delivered to patients on the basis of characteristics? And what we found was that the, about 80% of the medical students reported seeing um, disparities based on language barriers sometimes or very often, or often in, in, during their uh, clerkship time, during their eight weeks of clerkship. Likewise, very often with substance abusers, homelessness, obese patients, and with uh, patients and with minority patients. Here, they are, here are the data for minority patients with around 70% for Latinos and African Americans, slightly smaller for Asians, and then Middle Easterns. So what are they talking about? What are the, the students saying when they say, yes, we saw healthcare disparities? Well, we, um, had, uh, we selected a, a group of students for, uh, randomly for interviews. We talked to them about what they saw. And here are the, some of the things that they reported. Under language barriers, a student said, we rounded on non-English speaking patients without an interpreter every day. Another student said, families, friends, or young children were asked to, ask, were asked to act as interpreters due to lack of appropriately timed interpreter availability. The first two is bad practice. The last one is against the law. A doctor delivered a diagnosis of Elsa Let's precancer on a pap smear and gave follow-up recommendations all in English, despite me telling her that the patient was primarily Spanish-speaking. Here's a quote from what they said around homelessness. They made nothing of his pain. They treated it as, this is probably him coming back for alcohol, him coming back for food. He just wants housing. It took them much longer to, to get to him, and in the end, they discharged him without doing uh, anything. And examples around race ethnicity. In reference to an African-American man, they, they, uh, the student said, he was transferring care, and he had previously been on a pain contract, that's for pain medications, which he had never violated. His primary care doctor also personally vouched for the fact that there had been no issues with drug-seeking behavior. Nevertheless, my attending was very vocal in her suspicion that he was selling the medications and that she felt uncomfortable prescribing her. I felt like her suspicion was based on his race and socioeconomic status since she routinely provided similar regimens to other patients for similar conditions. In reference to an African-American woman presenting with classic signs of stroke, the student said, she came in with the ambulance, but the triage people minimized her pain. My residents speculated that perhaps race or her comorbidities or how she looked had to do with it. She was in the triage room for greater than six hours, and TPA, which is the medicine for stroke, uh, um, could no longer be given. The stroke protocol was never called. At least you think that our students are, first, I need to tell you, we're proud of presenting our data in the sense that we're proud of being an institution that can examine its own healthcare disparities. Uh, we have no doubt that, uh, that it is, is uh, much, uh, that, uh, that we represent uh, good practice compared to other places, though clearly there's a lot that needs to be improved. What our students tell us about is in line with a classic experiment I thought you might uh, want to know about. And this is from a guy named Kevin Schulman, in 90, uh, who published this in the New England Journal in 1999. What he did was take actors, two women, one younger, one older, two men, one younger, one older, um, two white women, younger and older, and two white men. And they were videotaped. And then the, um, giving us identical scripts, reading identical scripts about chest pain that they had. Then those videos were shown at a national conference of physicians. And physicians were told, please come in, watch this video, and tell us if you would refer this patient for further cardiac testing. And they, that we were, they were told that, we were, that uh, the investigators were studying decision making, clinical decision making, and how cardiac testing is. And for the identical symptoms and the identical 
presentation. Uh, the men were referred for cardiac testing in equal amounts, irrespective of whether they were young and old or black or white. The women were referred, uh, uh, um, were not. And in fact, older African-American women was referred much less often for cardiac testing than any of the other amounts, though there was a tendency toward that among younger African-American women as well. This study has been repeated many, many times with different populations. This study was with internists, but with cardiologists, with uh, cardiac fellows, with medical students, and it always shows the same thing, which is that for black women, physicians are much less likely to refer for appropriate testing. So this is what the uh, IOM asked. How could well-meaning, highly educated health professionals working in their usual circumstances with diverse populations of patients create a pattern of care that appears to be discriminatory? How could this happen? Well, it's complicated. One of the concepts that is more and more being used now is one of implicit bias. What's implicit bias? Excuse me, bias in which people are unconscious of having that bias. Uh, so for example, for identical vignettes, um, physicians rated white patients, uh, uh, sorry, black, uh, white patients as um, being more likely to have social support, uh, being more likely uh, to, um, uh, to comply, and being very pleasant. And again, these are uh, vignettes with uh, actors. And this is sort of assumed, uh, this is sort of how people saw these patients with very little evidence around it. And this is, again, complicated. In very nice studies done at uh, the bedside after a patient has had an invasive cardiac procedure and geography where dye is shot into the cardiac arteries, and the doctor comes out and tells the patient what they found, how many arteries were blocked or and so on, the doctors gave less information to their African-American patients. The African-American patients asked fewer questions. And there was less social comfort, less social chatter picked up by the, uh, by the microphones. Less, oh, is your wife in the waiting room? Oh, who are these folks at the, at the bedside? How are you doing? You're going to have to take it easy. Good things the Giants game is on TV, those sorts of things that account for uh, our, make, put our patients at ease and give us familiarity and put them at ease, at ease enough that the arrows can go the other way. When we have more social comfort, they may ask more questions and then as patients ask more questions, we give them more information. I hope that makes some sense. These are complicated uh, sorts of things to explain quickly, but I want you to know that there are all types of studies, including these audio tape studies, that are trying to disentangle how these things happen, what actually happens in the room between uh, physicians and patients. You're doing a great job. Oh, well, thank you. Um, so to summarize where we are, People are clear that healthcare disparities exist and that those are often, meaning differences in the quality of health, and are often associated with worse health outcomes. And they think that stereotypes and implicit bias contribute to health disparities. We, te we teach people that bias is a norm. It's not indicative of personal shortcomings. There are very few uh, out and out racists in medicine. It is, uh, uh, this is not what we think is actually going on in, 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 in the exam room. But we also think that educational strategies can help, can help mitigate this and can help uh, particularly younger generations of physicians do differently. So I think I will only give you two seconds on the, on the operation of the healthcare systems um, in order to go toward the recommendations. One of the things that's important question to ask is, are minority patients clustered in lower performing health systems? Or are they treated differently within the same health system? And you might have a sense of that from the data I showed you just from UCSF, that this is certainly true. 
but it is also true that patients are clustered within lower performing systems. So I'm going to uh, simply tell you that quality improvement efforts can um, mitigate health disparities, but one has to be very vigilant. One can have a quality improvement where two groups improve, but the gap stays the same. Or you can have quality improvement in which everyone improves and you narrow the gap. You can also have interventions that improve quality and yet widen the gap. So for example, interventions when new technology is introduced. And that often gets, uh, um, gets uh, uptake, uptaken first by a more affluent population. So here's my view of what causes disparities in healthcare. Bad systems, bad doctors, bad science, and unfortunately, bad history. <laughs> So let me tell you what I mean by that. Bad system speaks to the fragmentation of the healthcare system, that, quali that the quality of care is difficult for many people. Anyone who's ever been sick or taken care of someone with a serious illness or serious chronic illness knows how hard it is to navigate our healthcare system despite the best of intentions. Also, resources tend to be allocated by the marketplace and not by clinical need. Some hospitals can have many MRI machines. Some hospitals can have few or none. By bad doctors, I do not mean racist doctors or biased doctors. I mean doctors that are undertrained in these issues and undertrained in communication and in critical thinking and who are unaware, uh, perhaps, of their own blind spots when they approach patients. Bad science is a topic for another day, but this has been an uh, area uh, where I've had some uh, interest in looking at how market economics um, uh, tends to highlight small differences in response to medication um, so that for many years we were inappropriately using or not using medications in different populations. And finally, there is bad history. I made this slide because I was not born in the United States. I'm actually uh, from Argentina. And I was thinking about some of my, the older patients that I was seeing. And I tried to say, OK, when were they born? And what was happening at that time? So if I see a patient in their 80s now, they were born in 1934 when the Hill-Burton Act ended official uh, black hospitals and white hospitals because it was a federal act that said you could no longer have uh, uh, segregated, formal segregated health care. My patient would have been 20 and passed the age of formal education by the time the Brown decision ended formal segregation in public schools. Unfortunately, as you probably know, um, uh, schools are again as segregated as they've ever been. She would have been an adult by the time the Civil Rights Act finished formal segregation, legal segregation in the South of the United States, and would have lived through the, the, the civil rights movement, including the great promise, uh, the, the great strides and, the, uh, and, and promises of uh, uh, um, there. Would have been 40 by the time the Tuskegee hearings came out and President Carter apologized for the syphilis experiments on African American patients. Lived to see the overwhelming epidemic of HIV, the attacks on affirmative action, and then uh, the election of Obama, and now the election of Trump. And so when my 80 year old, say, in this case, African American patient from the South, who's here, now been living here since the 40s, when they come into a room, and I come into the room, this person from Argentina, a different country, different uh, cultures, and we need to understand each other, you can see how easy it is for people not to remember this history. And this, always, this, history always, this slide always makes the medical students gasp because they're so young. <laughs> so my view on how to eliminate disparities in health, we need better doctors and different doctors. We need better systems, and we need much more tailored support. And that's an area where the healthcare system is going to navigators, promotoras. We need to allocate healthcare resources based on healthcare needs, and we need to remarriage clinical care and public health. 
and maybe I'll end right there and, uh, and have Dean continue uh, with this theme. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alicia. Um, how many of you have watched Monty Python? All right, this is a little bit like now for something completely different. So actually, Alicia did a marvelous job at making the distinction between health disparities and health care disparities, um, which is very important from a health policy and social policy standpoint. Yet, when the patient comes in the room, as you were implying with your 80-year-old African-American patient, they're coming in with life exposures, a trajectory of health and illness, um, a history, uh, personal attributes, social conditions, all of which we as clinicians need to uncover and understand and attempt to address in an affirmative fashion. And that by doing that, we can actually improve quality of healthcare and perhaps reduce both health and healthcare disparities. So um, the different part is, and you're gonna get used to this with me, is I like to tell some stories. So I'm gonna start this off with a story, a true story that Margaret Wheeler actually helped me edit back in the day. Um, it's called The Disability Blues. And for those of you who like um, literature, this is a story obviously about music, it's about the blues. I want you to count how many times you hear a musical reference. That'll be a prize at the end. Okay, so it's uh, called The Disability Blues. I glance at my nurse's annotation. New patient, history of substance abuse, here for disability reevaluation. Which means that the guy's on disability, but every year or so he's gotta go back to the doctor and we have to certify whether or not he is um, disabled and can continue to receive Medicaid benefits. Mr. E, a 56-year-old man, enters my examination room. To describe him as dishe disheveled is to oversimplify. He shuffles towards me in trash pick sneakers whose tongues wag for want of laces. His pants, pants bunch at his ankles like an accordion. Barely clinging to his hips, they drag down his whole being. Nose to the ground, he is forced to look straight up, past his brow in silver afro, just to achieve eye contact with me. His posture suggests a question mark. He drools, unable to counter the gravitational pull on his lower lip. Gravity is the force that brings him to my doorstep. He is truly down and out. I invite him to take a seat and I wonder what will become of our interaction. Will I diagnose ankylosing spondylitis? That's a degenerative spinal disease because he's so, his posture is so poor. Or severe arthritis? Will I obtain x-rays documenting the sorry state of his vertebral column and describe the resultant functional impairments? Will I uncover cirrhosis or HIV infection or find no diagnosis other than urban decay, a diagnosis nobody wants to pay for? And most of all, how will I be able to relate to this question mark of a man? I begin our interview with a standard medical questionnaire. His responses are marked by frequent digressions and an aggressive tone. Our initial few minutes leave me frustrated. My frustration is obvious. He becomes equally frustrated. Our mutual agitation crescendos. I think I may have to end the interview and refer him elsewhere. Changing the tone of our conversation, I ask him what type of work he used to do. Well, I, I played the trombone, he rasps. Yeah, I played with the greats, but no more. No, sir, no more. Really? I am stimulated and reawakened. I play saxophone. He responds with an edentulous, cavernous, and soaring smile. No kidding, Doc. I smile a smile of polished ivory teeth. <laughs> well, I'm not so good, but it's still fun. That's cool, Doc, real cool. Hey, I got a sax playing Doc. He then recounts the gigs with Bill Evans, Dizzy Gillespie, John Coltrane, and Miles Davis. All those gigs, all the good times, all the girls, and he smiles, and as he talks, he taps his foot to a rhythm of the past. His smile gradually surrenders to gravity's lamenting pull downward. But now, Doc, now I got no chops. He tells me about his heavy drinking, the heroin, the bad times. He can't remember much after that. 
We talk some more, talk jazz, talk about Oakland in the 60s and 70s. He tells me about the methadone. That's a heroin replacement. Gives me the name of his payee. That's the person who receives his paycheck because he can't manage his own funds. And his friend at his temporary hotel. Then I return to his medical history. Now he willingly shows me his big scar from my bleed and ulcer and his swollen feet. He is bad with details. His short-term memory is obviously very poor. He is undoubtedly demented. I briefly examine him, order some blood work, and ask him to return in two weeks. He takes my card with the appropriate time, with the appointment time, and he pockets it. As he leaves, I wonder what would have happened had we not stumbled upon this common interest. Would we have parted angrily, each cast into a stereotyped role that neither of us was comfortable fulfilling? Our racial, social, and class differences so great that only such fortuitous connections can rescue the clinical encounter. Was this good fortune, a narrow escape from the frequent failure to recognize the basic shared humanity that should sustain any therapeutic relationship? Mr. E misses his follow-up appointment, but he returns four weeks later. His blood work is normal. I perform a mini mental state exam. That's a 30-item questionnaire to assess people for Alzheimer's and other forms of uh, memory loss and dementia. We move at a snail's pace. He is scoring miserably. When faced with one of the final items, please write a sentence. That's the final item. He takes my pen and wraps himself around the paper. I tell him to take his time and I sit down to do my charting. A few seconds later, he reaches out and passes me the paper. This is what it showed. Write a sentence. I look at his face, a smile, an unmistakable look of pride. What does it say, I ask? Boom, boom, dig it a boom, boom. I give him a point for it. <laughs> so what I'd like uh, to take the next 20 minutes or so doing is um, talk about this integration of the social determinants of health into uh, the office encounter, into the care that we provide for patients. And, and Margaret is absolutely right that when, when we started there 25 years ago, you know, we kind of knew things were different at San Francisco General, um, but we hadn't quite figured out whether there was a sweet spot that we could find where we could make those connections with our patients, uncover the kinds of social vulnerabilities, the conditions that underlie the prevalence and the severity of their disease, and whether we could connect with them to understand the assets and resources and resilience that they have, because they made it this far that we could harness to help them um, help themselves. And so um, that's what I'd like to talk about with you today. And um, these are two of my patients that I will talk about at the end, the, the two men. Uh, the woman is also one of my patients, but I'm going to be talking about these two men um, that will become obvious why in a moment. So the objectives of my talk are to deconstruct this construct of vulnerable populations. What does that even mean? and then present an approach that tries to integrate the social determinants of health with health care to reduce health care disparities for vulnerable patients, and uh, um, highlight the importance of eliciting the patient's story. A little bit, you got a little bit of a flavor of that today, and often that's all it takes is a little story, a little flavor. Um, and by listening to the patient's story, carefully and mindfully, one can assess social vulnerabilities and identify points of resilience that can be the secrets to providing better quality care. And I'm going to do that by providing you a real live, not so live anymore, but real case um, uh, in, a, in a patient with diabetes and walk you through the thought process that we went through with this case to try to understand what was going on with her. So let me just go academic on you a little bit here. Um, the best definition that I've seen of vulnerable populations is one that has been developed by epidemiologists. Epidemiologists are scientists who, who study patterns of disease. 
who gets what, who's at risk for this, is secondhand smoke a risk factor for that? And the way epidemiologists think about vulnerable populations is that they are subgroups of the larger population that because of social, economic, political, structural, geographic, and historical forces, just think about that last slide Alicia showed about that 80-year-old African-American's life exposures and history, the politics, the social turmoil and social change, the economic um, conditions, the historical forces, all of these things can lead subgroups to be exposed to a greater risk of risks, which I'll explain in a minute. And thereby, they're at a disadvantage with respect to health and their health care because they're at a higher risk of being exposed to risks. The greatest example, most concrete example I can give you was a study about a year ago that looked at the blood tests of uh, children in America measuring for a chemical called cotinine, which is the byproduct of nicotine. It's how you measure whether someone is smoking or has been exposed to secondhand smoke. And what these investigators found in this national study was that if you were a low-income African-American child, you had about a 50% chance of having a detectable cotinine, nicotine, secondhand smoke, in your body. Whereas if you were an upper-income white child, it was 3%. 50% versus 3%. If you were low-income white, it was about 20%. If you were high-income black, it was about 20%. But if you were the combination of black and poor, it was 50%. This child has done nothing other than be born. And they already are on a trajectory of exposure to higher risk of risks. Because it's not secondhand smoke in and of itself is not a disease. It's just a risk factor for asthma, heart disease, stroke, et cetera. So you can see how these vulnerabilities can cluster and interact with each other to create and conspire with each other to create greater risk and greater illness. So here's the case I'd like to kind of revolve the rest of the talk on. This is, um, we'll call her Ms. Jimenez. She's a 57-year-old English-speaking Latina who's a mother of five with three grandchildren. She has high blood pressure, a history of depression, arthritis, and insulin-dependent diabetes that is poorly controlled. As you know, diabetes is a condition in which your blood sugar is high, and some people it gets so high they need to take insulin to lower their blood sugar. Well, she presented for the first time to the hospital, um, she presented to the first time after having been hospitalized for three days for low blood sugar, not the high blood sugar of diabetes, but severely low blood sugar that, that made it impossible for her to go about her business. She was barely conscious and was brought to the emergency room. The hospital service that cared for her for three days was unable to identify what the trigger was for the low blood sugar. And then she came to see us in clinic. The question we, of course, asked was, why? why? Why might this happen? And I'll just tell you that we know when you open up a textbook of, of medicine, there are lists of the causes of hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, and it's kidney failure, uh, liver failure, um, certain tumors that, um, that pump out insulin. Um, we can find those lists. But until Margaret Wheeler wrote the textbook on the care of vulnerable patients, you couldn't find the list of the social causes of hypoglycemia. So when we try to teach our medical students and our colleagues how to learn anything in medicine, we do it through the use of mnemonics. Mnemonics are it's from the Greek root, like amnesia, memory. Uh, mnemonics are little tricks to help us remember stuff because there's so much to remember in medicine and no person can actually remember these things. And in the pre-iPhone days, you couldn't look them up unless you carried 20 textbooks around with you. Um, so we use mnemonics, which I, I have a mnemonic for mnemonic. Um, my neurons erase memory, only names improve cognition. So I'm going to give you two more mnemonics over the course of this uh, talk. Um, and this is how we try to engage our trainees in learning the other causes of hypoglycemia beyond the medical textbook causes. 
So here's the mnemonic, it's vulnerabilities. And you'll recognize many of these from the list of social determinants of health that Alicia shared with us. Violence, violence in the home, violence in the community, uh, uninsured, literacy and language, uh, neglect, elder neglect, um, self-neglect, economic hardship, food insecurity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are the common, I don't know if it's 12 or 11, but these are far and away the most common social vulnerabilities that our patients come to the encounter with. They don't come with a sign that says, I've got V, L, N, and T. They, we don't know what those are. And in fact, sometimes we, may falsely, we make false assumptions about, oh, this guy must be homeless, or this guy must be a drug abuser, and we, we're often wrong. So, um, but the biggest mistake is if we don't consider these factors as contributing to either the onset of the disease or the challenges that the person has managing the disease. So uh, the three, so I'm going to give you, I'm going to play this out. Um, but I think before I do, I want to share with you, and Alicia alluded to this when she talked about um, hospitals that are under-resourced, that we need to have a healthcare system that is not just beholden to the marketplace, but also responds to the needs of the patients that we care for and the populations that we care for. So there is something um, known as the inverse care law. The inverse care law, actually, before I do it, this was, this was uh, derived from a family physician in uh, the United Kingdom. As you know, it's, they have a national health care system, socialized medicine, bad word, socialized medicine. And um, the way it works in the UK is a general practitioner gets a swath of geography, and they're like, yep, that's your swath. Good luck to you. Take care of everybody in it. And you get a different swath depending on what lottery number you picked. And um, he was a very uh, diligent physician, and he would get to work at about 7. He'd go home at 7. He didn't play golf on Wednesdays, and he worked all day Saturday. He was working, working, working. He took Sunday off to be with his family. And then he started talking to some of his colleagues who were working in West London, and they were golfing on Wednesday, and they were home by 4, and they had dinner with their families, and they were certainly not working on Saturday. And as an epidemiologist, because he was also trained as an epidemiologist, he did a formal study of the work hours of general practitioners in London as it relates to the income levels of the swath of territory that they care for. And he found definitively and created a hypothesis called the inverse care hypothesis that says access to and quality of health care is inversely proportional to the needs of the population. The sicker the population, the less you're going to get. And in fact, the greater the market orientation of the health care system, the greater that inverse care law becomes. And in fact, the national health system has subsequently developed workarounds to try to both incentivize and over-resource doctors like Dr. Tudor Hart so that they're not in this situation. So there'll be extra nurses, extra outreach workers, et cetera, et cetera, to try to reverse the inverse care law. And this entire course that you're, you have kindly attended is about attempting to reverse the inverse care law, which has been shown again and again in countries across the globe to indeed be a law. And for those of us who work in safety net healthcare settings like San Francisco General, it often feels, right? I mean, we just looked at that list of vulnerabilities. Alicia listed the determinants of health. You know, you've got 15, 20 minutes with your patient. Like, oh my God, how are we going to? And she's got five or six diseases. How are we going to do it all? It often can feel like you're Sisyphus trying to roll the ball up. And as soon as you get it up the hill, down it comes again. And there you go again. Now, the thing nowadays is we, are, we work as teams. So, you know, maybe there were five of us pushing up the boulder. And hopefully, the patient's pushing it up with us as well, but this can be a very discouraging and frustrating thing, particularly for junior doctors who have not necessarily been well trained in how do you finesse and manage these complex patients with medical and social problems. So whenever you have a question about what to do, you should turn to Jerry Garcia from The Grateful Dead, who said somebody has to do something and it's just incredibly pathetic that it has to be us. And it really, it, it, as it turns out, particularly in the 2016 Trump era, it turns out it pretty much is up to us. So um, that's what I'm going to talk about, how we as clinicians can either 
mitigate the situation or amplify and worsen it. So I want to um, set up our discussion about our patient by just reviewing the three ways that vulnerabilities, social conditions, can lead to poor health. The first is the most obvious. You have a vulnerability, let's say you're homeless and you're in Chicago, guess what? You're more likely to get pneumonia because you're homeless in Chicago in the winter. That's number one. That's the direct arrow. The second mechanism is, let's say you have um, diabetes, but you have, and that's the disease state circle, but you have limited literacy skills and you have difficulty with math and numbers. And so it becomes difficult for you to manage your diabetes or you are, you're food insecure, right? You don't have food 30 days out of the week. So it becomes hard for you to do the diabetic diet. And so um, that disease state in the context of a vulnerability, it's the vulnerability that makes your health worse with a pre-existing disease. That's the second most common. And then the third, the one that we're here to talk about today is a very complex one in which we as clinicians can either enter into a therapeutic alliance with the patient or we can allow our prejudices and biases and inabilities to connect and communicate to interfere with health care so that substance abusing guy I just talked to you about, I may go like, you know, I'm sick and tired of taking care of heroin users. You know, they're just killing themselves. I, I got better things to do with my time. He's a nice guy. I'll do my best for 10 minutes, but then I'm going to move on. I'm not going to really go the distance. So if one gains the skills and has the attributes and attitudes and support of colleagues and systems around one, one can actually learn to develop a therapeutic alliance and in so doing actually do some magic for patients with vulnerabilities. Perhaps even more than we can do for more entitled patients because folks are starting off in such a bad place that sometimes it's just simple interventions that can help them. So, um, so to, visually this means eliciting the patient's story while doing that, assessing for vulnerabilities and strengths and building a therapeutic alliance. And the sweet spot is the center of those three areas, those, that Venn diagram. Eliciting the patient's story, it turns out, reveals hidden treasures that can humanize, as I shared with you in the story that I started off with. And it can also help contextualize the medical problem. Why is this patient with asthma continuing to be hospitalized? The medical student will give me 27 different diagnoses. Churg-Strauss syndrome. You know, she'll, she'll give me the whole list of things that, that are not asthma. But maybe it's just that she's in a house with secondhand smoke, right? So we uncover the story. We identify the vulnerabilities. And we're also trying to listen to the resilience that our patients have. Everybody, no matter how down and out they are, has assets and resources up their sleeves. It could be their spirituality and religion. It could be their prior employment or expertise or their current expertise, the social support and networks that they have, the intimates in their life, what makes them laugh, the institutions that they are supported by, the things that bring them energy and enthusiasm. These are things you can ask the patient to uncover and then uh, provide the patient confidence around. My favorite is this one, the N, because this, here's the other acronym, if you haven't noticed, resilience. The N is, you know, that's, that's, some, that's a lot of challenges you, you face and you've got, you know, you've been marginally housed, you're, you're in recovery from alcohol, you've got six kids and, you know, your husband's got Alzheimer's. <laughs> that's a lot. But look at, I mean, look at you. How have you, you clearly made it this far, right? Despite all of that, um, how have you gotten through all these difficult times in the past? What's your secret to success? And everybody has a story. Well, you know, Doc, I just, I'm a very positive person. Or, well, Doc, you know, I've got my best friend and she's with me all the time. Or, I, God, you know, I spend time. What, or sometimes they even say, you, doctor, it's all about you. That's rare. But when it happens, it's a nice thing. But anyway, these are the ways to learn about the assets and um, resources that, that people have. They're very, very important to not only be focused on the negative 
conditions that they've lived in because they've also had positive. So the case, remember the woman with diabetes admitted for low blood sugar, and I'm going to tell you the answer was that she had limited literacy skills, okay? Limited literacy skills. She couldn't, so how might that lead to low blood sugar? Just throw out some, some guesses here. This is not the test. This is just interactivity. How might? Okay, so that, that might lead, you're absolutely right, you can't read the labels on the food, you're not sure what the sugar content is, that might lead you to have a high blood sugar and get diabetes to begin with, right? But you're right. How might it lead her to paradoxically suffer from a low blood sugar? She couldn't read how to uh, measure her medication. Okay, so have you ever pulled up, like, seen people with their insulin syringes and the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest numbers with units on them and you have to draw it up just so? And uh, So maybe she's been doing medication errors, right? She's, instead of giving herself 10 units of insulin, she gave herself 100 units of insulin. Very possible, and we've studied this, and we've shown this is absolutely, this does happen in people with limited literacy and numeracy skills. How else might limited literacy explain how, why she got low blood sugar? Uh, makes messages from lots of different places and indecisive. Just confused, like just confused. And we've shown that patients with limited literacy skills are much more likely to report that they are very confused about their medical care, just period. So they're just doing the best they can, but not understanding. Another mechanism is that they haven't learned, even though we might have taught them, that when you use insulin, you have to do it on a full stomach. You have to have eaten before you take your insulin, or else you're now going to lower your blood sugar, and if you've got no buffer there, you haven't eaten, you are at risk of having low blood sugar. So all of these things could explain why she might have had limited, I'm sorry, hypoglycemia, and I was absolutely sure that's what it was, and I'll just tell you, it wasn't. <laughs> she read beautifully, she showed me how she pulled up her insulin, it was right on the nose, I was completely off on that one. Um, I'll just jump ahead. Um, so here's the case again. It wasn't limited health literacy. Well, um, perhaps it's food insecurity. How might food insecurity, which is not having the reliable access to high quality food 30 days out of the month, how might that lead to hypoglycemia? You binge eat, so in the first two weeks of the month, you're riding high, your blood sugar's 500, right? You go see the doctor, the doctor's like, man, your blood sugar is 500. We gotta increase that insulin. We increase the insulin, they go home. Now at the end of the month, they've run out of money. What, what do you do when you run out of money? You give the food to the eight grandchildren and the five, whatever it is, you grandma don't eat, and then you plummet in your blood sugar, right? So this is a, this is a clear provider, patient, misunderstanding, I'm trying to do the right thing, and I actually nearly kill her, right? So food insecurity is another common, I mean, this is what we used to think of hunger was, but this is the new face of food insecurity. It's people who are exposed to periods of time when they have uh, food adequacy, but they remember that the two weeks prior they were really hungry, so they're binging on high caloric, cheap, cheap, cheap food and getting obese. And then in the last week or two, run out of food and have all these compensatory uh, strategies to try to, um, you know, they skip meals, they reduce caloric intake, and you're going to hear much, much more about this from the famous Hillary Seligman, so I'm going to have you hold, hold your question, who's going to give an hour talk on this important public health and clinical issue. Um, so I was like, that's what she's got. She's food insecure, right? And totally wrong. She was not food insecure. She actually had access to all the um, food banks and churches, and she was stocking up, and she was fine in terms of food security. Okay, now in red I have violence. What, what could that mean? Well, how could that possibly lead to hypoglycemia? And this was a case from our clinic, from our very own clinic, 
where I work with these lovely nurses, how might violence lead to hypoglycemia? Any, any thoughts? Nurses are welcome to have a hypothesis. Yeah? Well, if you're upset all the time, when I'm upset, I don't eat. Great. So the stre overwhelming stress, either because of violence in the home or violence in the neighborhood or whatever, and you're just not nourishing yourself and you're taking the insulin. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any other? Think like uh, Columbo, for those of you who remember like that detective show. Well, you said you were hypoglycemic for three days, did you? Right. So. So it turned out, and I knew this, I had known this woman for 10 years, and I had written papers on domestic violence, and my wife is a domestic violence attorney, family law attorney, and I missed this. This woman had an abusive husband who would inject her with her insulin as a means of control and violence, and that's what had happened. And by uncovering that, I mean, that was a game changer for her. I mean, it wasn't like overnight she was now liberated and free. It took some time, but this was a, you know, criminal charges were brought against him. And so some of these vulnerabilities are deeply held um, concerns. And many people are very ambivalent about disclosing them to their physician. And we often feel like we may be prying. Um, but they're often indispensable to understand the patient and to be able to, in this case, empower her both for her diabetes and for her life in general. Obviously a dramatic case, and not every case, is a case of a domestic violence perpetrator injecting people with insulin. Um, but we are not short on drama when you actually listen to people's stories. They are quite compelling uh, stories of suffering and of resilience. So let me just close um, by saying, I hope I have been able to deconstruct this construct of vulnerable populations by having you think about it as these subgroups who are at greater risk of risks, and often they're multiple risks. Um, present an integrated approach to trying to bring in some of these social determinants of health into the clinical encounter and try to address them, not just sort of be, what is it called when you're just watching things and not doing anything about, like a peeping Tom, what is that word? Voyeur. Not a voyeur, not voyeuristic, right? It's not about that. It's about the therapeutic alliance and creating appropriate treatment plans with the patient. Um, by eliciting the narrative, assessing for vulnerabilities and resilience. And I tried to show you how this might play out with a real case um, wherein the first round of doctors were thinking very medically, and then the second round of doctors were thinking very socially but kept getting it wrong and finally got it right. Um, and I want to just um, give you a quote from Fitzhugh Mullen, who is a pediatrician and a leader in education, who is a lovely guy, who says, there needs to be a little Don Quixote in all health practitioners, right? He was a little kooky, Quixote, right? But he had a mission, and it was to save humanity, and a particular damsel, but it really was a metaphor for humanity. So he says, there needs to be a little Don Quixote in all health practitioners, locked in on the mission, undaunted by the doubters and the half-hearted, because it's very easy to just become cynical and say, you know, these things are so huge. These are social forces. I can't do anything. Well, it turns out one can, um, and, and we do. And I want to just share, close, and then we can open it up to discussion um, with, since I told you I'm going to be telling you stories, I'm going to tell you another story, but this is a poem. And this is a poem about the two men that I showed you in the first slide. Um, and this is now probably ooh, a year and a half ago. But these two men died within a week of each other. And these guys were great guys. I mean, these were great, great guys. These were guys, when I would walk into the visit, I, I would just have a great time with. And you know, Alicia showed that slide about you know giving information and asking questions, or lack thereof. I mean, these were guys that we were having real conversations with, I was having real conversations with, over many, many years, 25 years. So let me tell you the story about these two dead men. One a refugee from Cuba, always in white, skin black and smooth, fitting the mold from bottom to top, 
white leather shoes, white pants, white linen shirt, crowned with a Havana, of course. The other, tall, lanky, happy, and old, a former ball player in the West Coast Negro League, pitched for the Sea Lions until he threw his shoulder out of its socket and could throw no more. The first, always smiling, laughing even, gold sparkling from a tooth, bejeweled with bling like epaulettes from his favorite pastime, Reno with Maria. That was Maria in the picture there. He would always come in with that bling. Um, the second, never sure of his age, either 93 or 88, his Louisiana birth certificate, unable to read it, but he knows it bears false witness. Keeps his, numbers, his daughter's phone number safe, Perline, on the inside brim of his omnipresent baseball cap. The former, still alive because he quit tobacco 25 years ago after being filleted open to plumb his heart. Proud of his medical survival skills and grateful for his doctor, that's me, while smacking his big round belly, pregnant with hope and worry. The latter is still alive because he quit smoking 25 years ago after being told his lungs are vanishing. Owe my life to my doctor. So he says and so he believes. Now chained to an oxygen tank, not sure if it's worth it anymore. Two brothers. Resilient, living in parallel, struggling in parallel, full lives behind them, now both suddenly dead within days of each other, leaving behind their doctor. How can it be that these two men, bedeviled by society, could become the favorites of their doctor? What can fill the absences when one is robbed of one's favorites and their love is lost? Thank you for your attention. So we have a good 10, 12 minutes for discussion. It doesn't have to be questions. It could be reflections. It could be experiences. It could be questions. At least you can answer them. I can't. And, and I'm sorry, before, just say who you are and maybe just one line about why you chose to come to this course. It's an unusual course. My name is Mike Daly. I've come to these programs for numerous years, so this particular one. Uh, early in your slides, you mentioned the word vulnerabilities and access, and I'm curious. The one thing I see in vulnerable people is a deeply embedded depression. That depression blocks their ability to make good decisions for themselves regarding their own outcomes, even when those outcomes are readily available from sincere medical professionals like the FBI or UCSF. So depression can be treated by family, by society, by, by all kinds of means. But do you agree that that is a, if the living in an environment that is depressing you. We have in this, a tragedy in this country now with veterans, suicide, military. We have obese people going off, and young people. These, these are treatments that can be perhaps dealt with, not by medical means, specifically, but anyway, do you have any questions? Well, I'll make a comment, and, and, and you can as well. I mean, uh, the prevalence, the rate of depression among vulnerable populations as we've defined them here, particularly those with medical illness, who have a coexisting depression is astoundingly high. For example, if you go to a um, private practice of uh, uh, a doctor who takes care of patients with diabetes, about 15% of those patients with diabetes will have comorbid, coexisting depression. In our clinic, it's about 60% will have moderate to severe depressive symptoms. So this is, this is an elephant in the room very, very often um, in the safety net healthcare system. Um, people who are of high socioeconomic status get depressed too, uh, right? We know that. Um, uh, the, but as you, I think, are implying, the social circumstances in and of themselves can situate people such that the biology and their environmental forces interact to create a perfect storm wherein the depression is more common, the depression is more intractable and difficult to treat, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and gets in the way of the medical care, et cetera. Um, one of the th primary things we try to do in the therapeutic alliance uh, 
is to try to enable the patient to convince themselves of their own value and give them hope that the depression can get better. And we're as devious as possible to try to get them into depression treatment. Um, I don't know if you had some, some thoughts uh, on that. Okay. I, I will, I just want to point out though, we have to be careful, and I, I know you were very careful in how you said it, not to somehow blame the depression because in our society, depression often is seen as a volitional, something willful, as opposed to something that just happens to oneself. And so we have to be careful when we talk about poverty and depression to, to situate and contextualize um, that in the right way so that we don't you know, do the blaming the victim thing. And I think your veterans example is a great one. I mean, the PTSD and the depression, the suicidality, I mean, it's like, it's not these guys' fault, you know? Yeah. Um, what did you ask us to tell you? Reflections, questions, okay. uh, yeah. This is a reflection. I, I have, so and I'll repeat the question. The phrase therapeutic alliance is really important. And I had um, the experience of accompanying a young man who at that time, uh, who is from Africa, from Sub-Saharan Africa, who at that time was like late high school into early college and had a um, fairly severe liver problem. So let me just summarize for people who can't hear. Yes. Uh, the situation is a young man uh, from Africa who had a fairly severe liver problem. And um, I had a very uh, unfortunate experience within the UCSF system, unfortunately, uh, with not with a physician. I think it was with a nurse. And um, she was very condescending. She was not American. She was, uh, I think, Asian is my recollection. Mm -hmm. And her English was very difficult to understand. And the condescending to the patient, you're saying? So just to, again, to summarize, I guess you accompanied him into some doctor's visits or hospitalization and had an experience, a negative experience, with a clinician uh, who herself wasn't a native English speaker and who appeared to be condescending to the patient, disrespectful to the patient. And he was not able or ready to ask her questions because of language barriers and cultural barriers, I did insist on asking her questions, and I got the same kind of response from her. The pushback. And mm -hmm. another individual who often accompanied this young man had the same experience with the same individual. What, what, does, the, what does the patient or the patient's families or friends do when they run into someone who is socially vulnerable and they don't feel that they've been treated so what is, what is one to do, and this can happen to anybody, but it seems to disproportionately happen to vulnerable patients. What does one do when one is socially vulnerable, either as the patient or a caregiver or a, a friend, to fix the problem? I think you should tackle this, because it gets back to some of the stuff you were, you were showing. It's a very interesting. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. It's a hard issue. Um, uh, the, it, I think the the short answer uh, might be that sometimes one has to switch clinicians. Exactly. Um, Request a new nurse. But um, the longer uh, uh, the longer one is to recognize, as you clearly have done, that people are usually unaware of their impact on others. Uh, the, um, in other words, a person might feel condescending or may simply be behaving condescendingly, then we don't know. But to, to be able to, in general, say, I would prefer if you spoke to me this way, or I would prefer that, that puts a lot of weight on the patient and, um, or the patient's family to confront a clinician in some way. And generally speaking, it's, it's too hard. Um, and so what ends up happening is that most people will say, can I have another doctor or can I have another nurse? And, and, just, and that's okay too. Can you I know? add one, one thought that, yeah. that now because this is increasingly recognized as a problem, um, many health systems, if not all, now have like an office of the patient advocate yes. where one can in an almost like an objective sense to someone who isn't involved say, listen, this is the experience I just had up in the intensive care unit it wasn't good, could you help out? And their job is to solve these problems. So there are, there's a movement to have more resources that patients and families and caregivers can go to that don't require them to like challenge the neurosurgeon, you know, and et cetera. 
and those uh, surveys that you're constantly filling out after you've been to a visit, um, those are actually taken very seriously um, uh, in terms of feedback on particular uh, staff and feedback on, on the operations of the clinic. You had a comment? Yeah, I had a comment back on, uh, on the depression, um, talking about depression and saying even depression slash mental illness. Um, like thinking that if you could cure the depression that you're gonna, I, I don't know if that's what you were referring to, if you could cure the depression that that would be, make it easier to cure their um, their medical problems. Um, I was a, I worked as a psychiatric nurse at San Francisco General inpatient for 10 years there and also in psych emergency. And there's lots of different depressions, some that do not respond at all, some very severe that we see in the hospital. And then there's other depressions. I mean, that, um, and I do think that a lot of it does have to do with socioeconomic status, how is, that, that there's uh, factors of how it's treated depending on socioeconomic status. And I just read a long article about Rachel Maddow in um, The New Yorker. Do you know Rachel Maddow on TV? She's, it's a long um, interview with her, and she talks about her depression. And she says she has these bouts of depression, but she doesn't want to take any medication for them because it's mm -hmm. going to affect her authenticity, is what she feels. And she feels that uh, if these bouts of depression, you know, in her life get worse as she gets older, that she realizes she may have to take medication one day. Um, so we have this huge spectrum, and then we're not even talking about, and, and I think that medicine has this thing where they- Compartmentalize. Yeah, yeah we, we talk about medicine, and, and we all, all doctors and everybody does this, medicine is one thing, and then psychiatry or is another. And yes. And social work is another. And and shall and never. Yeah. Oh. So I think that's a, a very a very helpful um, perspective. To summarize, um, to summarize, I think it's hard to summarize, but I think it would be to say that there are many different forms of depression and um, and many different ways in which people cope with it, and many w w different ways in which people can or cannot treat it. But that it isn't. Um, there's no sort of magic mm -hmm. bullet uh, um, um, for that. Is that is that a fair summary? And and I do think. Um, we, I talked a little bit about the fragmentation of the healthcare system um, as contributing to patients' poor outcomes, and nowhere is it worse than in the fact that we have pretty much two separate systems of care for mental health and physical health. Uh, and um, n you know, in the last 10 years, there's been much more movement both on the payer side and on the health system side to try to bring those together, but they're still quite separate. And, and it is precisely in that form of fragmentation that uh, these uh, illnesses um, even the ones that are, even the ones that, that are readily treatable um, can get worse. Can I, can I make just one, one other comment um, that probably comes back to your um, point a, a little bit and harks back to that slide I showed you about the three mechanisms where invulnerability can lead to poor health, the one that relates to the therapeutic alliance being the third, that if you look at this list of social vulnerabilities, including depression that's up here, each and every one of these can be a deeply stigmatizing issue. And what we see happening again and again is the person is suffering from a medical problem and experiences social vulnerability, and we amplify and exacerbate it by our failure to destigmatize, empathize, and normatize this as part of the human condition. And uh, so one of the real skill sets that we try to teach and, and acquire is the ability to have these empathic bridges when you acknowledge that the person is suffering from depression and you say, you know, so many people suffer from depression and it's horrible, but thankfully most of them get better and I, I'm confident that you're going to get better. That's a very different conversation than a whole slew of other ones you can imagine and some of which you may even have heard yourself uh, in, the, in, the, in the psychologist's couch um, that are not helpful uh, when talking about depression or domestic violence or immigrant status, et cetera, et cetera. Last um, 
last question or two or comment or two? Um, I had a question about, based on the research you had done with sort of the unconscious bias of the providers at UCSF, how are you taking that information and pulling it through within UCSF? Oh, they were all fired. They're gone. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for the question, which was about, um, given the data I showed about uh, healthcare, the, the, the prevalence of healthcare disparities even within our own system. Um, what are we doing with that data and how is that being fed back? Well, I'm, I'm happy to say that, um, that, that it is very much being fed back, um, both on the educational side in terms of helping students know how to cope and react and speak up when uh, things happen, but also on the healthcare, healthcare system side um, in terms of looking at common patterns of problems and trying to come up with ways to change them. So for example, we are now working, we don't have it yet, but we're now working on a a policy in which um, for patients who don't speak English that uh, attending would have to certify uh, daily that at least one uh, person used an interpreter, one physician used an interpreter to speak with that patient. That if they're sick enough to be in the hospital, they're sick enough to have a conversation with a physician. Um, so that we're moving toward that as a standard. Now of course mo most physicians have that standard anyway. but. It's a, a perennial problem in, uh, in, in, in actual practice. So we're moving toward a carrot and stick approach um, to, um, to, doing, to coping with those problems. And I'm proud to say that a lot of the leadership for that actually comes from our medical students, that they are able to see these problems, are being able to speak up, and, um, and we want to encourage that and come up with better systems um, to help them do that. Uh, but this, our research has been supported by the school and by the health systems. No one has said, you cannot do this research, you cannot publish this research. And that, that, that feels fortunate to me. So again, uh, just to be clear, I feel like um, we're exposing the problem, not because we're the worst. In my view, we're probably one of the best, but because we, are, we, 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 have, we have a commitment to exposing this problem. So I, I would see this in a very positive way. And with that, can I just clo just close? First of all, thank you all for your participation and for answering my clinical questions about hypoglycemia. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.